Hello all, welcome to the show. I'm Gus Gagliardi and this is Fire Code Tech. On Fire Code Tech, we interview fire protection professionals from all different careers and backgrounds in order to provide insight and a resource for those in the field. My goal is to help you become a more informed fire protection professional. Fire Code Tech has interviews with engineers and researchers, fire marshals, and insurance professionals, and highlights topics like codes and standards, engineering systems, professional development, and trending topics in the industry. So if you're someone who wants to know more about fire protection or the fascinating stories of those who are in the field, you're in the right place. On today's episode of Fire Code Tech, we have Kyle McKenzie. Kyle is an electrical engineer, and in this episode of Fire Code Tech, we get into emergency power requirements and some of their complexities. In this episode of Fire Code Tech, we address a couple of difficult design topics, including fire pump design, emergency power requirements for elevators, and the intricacies of high-rise occupancies. It's clear to see that Kyle has a great passion for electrical engineering and the codes and standards process. If you're looking to buff up on your emergency power requirements knowledge, this episode is a deep dive. On episode 17 of Fire Code Tech, Kyle gives us a little bit of insight into his career and some learning moments that he's had. Don't forget to subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode and follow us on social media. If you want to reach out and talk about podcast guest topics or sponsoring an episode of Fire Code Tech, you can reach me at ggagliardi at firecodetech.com. Let's dive into the show. No, it's, it's, it's unfortunate we didn't hit record before and we're talking about podcasting and about how that, me- that medium is really helpful, especially to busy people, busy parents, uh, busy working professionals. Yeah, I think it's, uh, I just love your point about it's easy to shoehorn it into the commute or the workout or folded laundry or, you know, whatever it is you're doing. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a huge fan too of the medium. So I just really resonate with that. And I consume a lot of podcasts and I consider myself, I don't have any kids, but I consider myself fair, fairly busy. So yeah, I like what you're saying about that, but it's pretty interesting. So yeah. How did you, how did you find out about the podcast or, you know, what brought you, what brought you to it? Well, um, Chris Logan has a, a podcast and Drew Slocum has a podcast that, that I was listening to before, uh, before your, your podcast came online. So um while searching for their podcasts, I, I noticed your podcast and you had a lot of great content. And um, now it's been one of the regular, your podcast has been one of the regular podcasts that I listen to. Wow. That's incredible. That I, you know, it's, uh, I mean, that's the goal always, but, you know, I don't always get to speak with individuals who are actually listening to the content. So that's a little bit surreal for me. Um, you know, it's the obvious. How'd you get started? How'd you get started into podcasting? So uh, it's funny is like I talk a little bit about this on the on Drew Slocum's episode we just released for uh, Fire Prevention Week. But yeah, basically I was working like in the beginning of, of 2019 and I was thinking, man, I really want to I want to do more with fire protection. I want to create a resource. I want to, you know, help create content online about fire protection because you know getting into the industry i've been in in the engineering specifically in fire protection for about three years and it's been uh it's been hard to reconcile the gaps in you know i I was formerly went to school for fire protection but of course uh, as any professional knows uh, school and the job are two different things so right yeah, just in the process of wanting to create some sort of content piece online and, you know, trying to fill the gaps between school and, you know, becoming a professional and learning how to be an engineer. And that's kind of the genesis of uh, what was the uh, start of the podcast. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of wild. Well, there's so much depth into our field, right? Where, you know, I'll listen yeah. to, I'll listen to, uh, architecture podcast and I listen to real estate podcast. I listen to podcasts from the fire service because when with everything I read and I listen to that is sort of out of the realm of electrical system design and fire alarm system design, but 
is necessary for me to understand. Yeah, I think it's interesting, and I use podcasts in a similar in a similar fashion. You know, in what I'm interested in, and also the peripheral areas of you know what I'm interested in to contextualize and to provide nuance in what you're interested in. So you know, the architect's going to have a different perspective or light on things than the engineer would. And yeah, I I use them in a similar fashion. I think that and. Uh, Another one of the big reasons I wanted to do a podcast is because I know that anybody who loves podcasts doesn't just listen to one. They listen to a bunch of them because, right. you know, even one a week is not enough to sate somebody who, you know, spends a lot of time in the car or, you know, like that's their preferred method of unwinding or finding entertainment. So I think that was another like part of it, too. Well, we, my, my company is, is a mid-sized company, right? We're about 25 people. So um, we all wear many hats, right? So in addition to electrical and fire alarm system design, I run multidisciplinary groups for uh, large projects. We're, pro, uh, we're in the progress of designing. So in terms of mechanical systems, plumbing systems, um, fire protection. And so... And also in terms of business development and in terms of business in general. So because of that, um, it's really important that I have a very large, uh, I think the words breadth of knowledge, a breadth of knowledge base. And um, if I, if all I did was focus on learning about electrical engineering and not learning about all these other aspects of, of what what I need to do in my occupation, um, I'd be missing out. Even soft skills too. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of great podcast content and also other types of content on um, really focusing on your soft skills. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think your story is a is a one that is not uncommon in the industry you know it firms from small to mid to even at large size there can be a real diverse role for um, engineers or fire protection engineers in specific have a really broad range of capabilities and types of systems that they're involved with so yeah I understand what you're saying yeah my company is uh, it's fairly large as far as architecture and engineering firms go, uh, you know, like 170 people, but, you know, th- we still only have, you know, th- three fire protection engineers in the, or four fire protection engineers in the company. So, I mean, that's still not a huge amount of places to go for, you know, excess stuff or different stuff or, you know, varying perspectives. So, I understand what you're saying about being a part of a small shop and needing to broaden your horizons as far as uh, what you need to be knowledgeable about. Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good point. For the people who don't know, can we get a little bit about your background and how you got into uh, you know, the construction field and engineering, Kyle? Sure, sure. Well, when I was in college, um, I first worked a couple summers for a general contractor and then I was introduced to an electrician who needed a helper. And I worked during the day for this electrical contractor while I was going to school at night. And while I was working for the electrical, electrical contractor, I was really, really interested in what I was doing. So um, I quickly declared my major, uh, I think about sophomore year, to be an electrical engineer. And actually still keep in contact with... Uh, the electrical con- the electrical contractor Bruce Knightage from Metropolitan Electric. You know, we'll we'll talk every now and again, and um, we'll bounce ideas off each other. We'll discuss electrical code sections and design and install problems. So I, I worked for for Bruce for about a year, and then um, I then worked for a friend's father who was a mechanical contractor for two and a half years. And I was doing a lot of uh, HVAC controls and wiring and, and troubleshooting um, in that effort, uh, still while pursuing my electrical engineering degree at night. So about the middle of my senior year of college, 
I was hired by Policy Consulting Engineers as the construction administrator because of my background working for an electrician and a mechanical contractor. Basically, my main duties were um, site observations, punch lists, reviewing shop drawings, answering RFIs, conducting surveys, that kind of stuff. Um, so while I was working construction administration, I was also pursuing a master's degree and then after my master's degree, my professional engineering license. Um, while in the construction admin effort, uh, I noticed some mistakes made by uh, one of the electrical, by the, ele the electrical engineer for the company at the time. Um, at the time, we were a small firm, so we had an electrical engineer, and and I brought that to the attention of the company president. And uh, long story short, that person was let go, and my myself and my boss took on that role of uh, designing the electrical systems because you know for for us, quality control is of utmost importance. So. Um, even the smallest of error, you know, just, just doesn't cut it. So um, the first first job that uh, me and Thomas Polisi sat down to design together, he says to me, by the end of this project, project, you better be a freaking brain surgeon. So, <laughs> so I, I took that to heart and, um, you know, it, it was really important for me to uh, fully learn and comprehend fire alarm and uh, uh, electrical systems and yeah interesting very interesting so the, it's uh it's cool to hear about your you know your origin story and how you got to uh, get a taste of uh, how contracting works and you know get involved with the actual installation I, but that's a valuable perspective now that you are um, working on the engineering engineering side of things and more the design side of things i'm sure that uh paints a better picture for what the role looks like you know uh, now that you're on the architects and engineers side of the table yeah it's been, it's been really really helpful to understand um how to service and maintain equipment uh what the what the process is for the actual installation when i when i design i'm I'm really able to uh, fully visualize what what I'm designing because of of my history as an installer. Yeah, that's awesome. I think it's you know I I had a similar uh, fortune of working for a fire suppression contractor right out of college, and I'm extremely thankful for that experience because um, while I don't have as much knowledge as somebody who does it you know full time and has been doing it for you know a decade or or what whatever amount of time, an extreme amount of time, I have a better idea of the physical constraints of the construction of that type of system. So I think it's a, a extremely valuable insight into the design process and, you know, realizing that um, everything looks good in the model. Um, but yeah. So yeah, it sounds like you have an interesting role now at Polisi Consulting. Um, It'd be interesting for maybe those who aren't as aware of, you know, what the construction and uh, the architects and engineering role is. Yeah, maybe could you go a little bit deeper into uh, what your work looks like or, you know, uh, the kind of jobs that you're involved in? Yeah, sure, sure. So um, our co company designs the mechanical, elect electrical, plumbing, sprinkler, and fire alarm systems for commercial res and residential buildings, uh, mostly in the New York and New Jersey area. But we're licensed all over and have uh, have done a ton of work all over the eastern seaboard. Um, due to the relationships we've fostered over the years, a good majority of our work is buildings that just meet high rise thresholds or a group of buildings that form a small sort of campus environment. So um, we do quite a bit of work that is involved in uh, emergency and standby power system design because we're, we're doing a lot of these uh, smaller high rise buildings or, or campus infrastructure that requires that knowledge base. Um, we've also done 
quite a bit of residential MEP system design. You know, we've done some exciting work. Like I've worked on Goldman Sachs executive offices, Ralph Lauren's apartment. Uh, we've rebuilt the Knickerho- Knickerbocker Hotel. But to be honest with you, I personally gravitate to projects that um, where there's different different interesting systems and problems involved. Like I recently uh, designed a balanced power isolated grounding system for a small 2,500 square foot recording studio. It was, uh, it was probably one of the most um, interesting projects I've done to date. Interesting. So when you're saying like a balanced power isolated grounding system for, you know, what makes that project so interesting since it's so small, you know, as compared to, you know, some of the probably larger high rise buildings that you've been involved with. Why is that uh, system or project um, more of a uh, interest for you? Well, so well, not to get too far into the technical details of a balanced power system, but your standard power system, um, your standard say fifteen amp receptacle, right? You have you have a hot and a neutral. You have one hundred and twenty volts going to your hot, and your neutral is your return, right? And you have an equipment equipment ground as well. But a balanced power system is different. So a balanced power system is a very specific system where you have an isolation transformer that that spits out 60, 260 volt um, 260 volt phases and so each of your receptacles instead of having uh, a ungrounded conductor and a neutral which is also called the grounded conductor you have 60 volts going to um, to each of those receptacles. And so the, the design requirements are much, much different. So um, the electrical code has very specific voltage drop requirements for those systems and very specific uh, receptacle installation requirements for those systems. So uh, there's a whole, ch- whole section of the NEC just uh, set for that type of system. And um, to apply that to a recording studio um it was a gratifying experience interesting so basically it sounds like since it's an alternative um type of uh, electrical system and that it sounds like there's also some added complexities um in comparison to your conventional um electrical system or receptacle so yeah that sounds interesting well uh sounds like you have a a big uh, emphasis or focus in your career on uh, electrical systems and like emergency power. I think, uh, yeah, that's something that I'm not as as well um, versed in as, a, you know, a more of a, um, a fire protection, solely fire protection uh, engineer. But uh, it's interesting um, to hear about your your specialty and work and it seems like a fairly common thing to run into electrical engineers who uh, are involved with fire alarm work. Well, in, in addition to my work at Polisi, I'm also uh, working with New York City um, on a voluntary effort to write amendments to the 2014 National Electrical Code and the specific article, articles of the code that um, – Myself and a and a team of engineers and electricians that that are working on is 700, 701, 702. So those so those areas of the code that specifically deal with emergency power. Interesting, very interesting. That's cool that you're involved in like a, is it like a code committee or how would you describe the the uh, the group you're working with to write these amendments? Yeah, we're we're a code we're a code an appointed code writing committee, and then I also attend um, code interpretation meetings for for New York City as well, where uh, electrical contractors and electrical su- engineers will submit questions and or sign off reconsiderations and stuff like that, and we'll uh, we'll review and we'll provide direction based on the electrical code. I've, I've always, um, ever since I got involved in this industry, you know, I really consider myself uh, um, an electrical code person. I, that's, that's probably what um, my strong suit is and what I'm most interested in, 
is. And when I'm when I'm on a job site or I'm in a meeting and someone says, this is up to code or this doesn't meet code. And then and then they don't say, well, the section I'm referencing is XXX of XXX. Um, when they don't say that, I end up spending all night long uh, trying to find that specific code section and fully understand what they meant by this is this is up to code or that doesn't meet code. And, and to be honest, my wife doesn't really like those, <laughs> appreciate those kind of nights. So. Yeah, that seems to be a catchphrase in the industry in general. That's code or it's code. And so that's that's funny that you say that. Yeah, I, I resonate with the, somebody who is uh, concerned with the code and I'm a self-professed code nerd myself. So Awesome. I understand for sure. Yeah, for I'm sure most people are aware of what the NEC is, but yeah, maybe for those who don't know or are only marginally aware of what the National Electric Code is, yeah, would you give like a high level overview of what that document is? All right. So NFPA 70 now in the 2020 version is uh, is a model code created by the National Fire Protection Association that's referenced by uh, referenced and written into law by all 50 states. Um, a lot of the states amend the code, like here in New York City, um, we're in the process of, of making amendments to the code cycle that we reference, which is NEC 2014. So actually right now we're on 2008 and we're blasting off into the future, if, uh, <laughs> all the way to 2014. Um, the NEC is very much an installation um, installation requirement document, whereas something like NFPA 110, NFPA 111 is more performance-based so that the the way that an engineer or, or an installer accomplishes a goal is, is to meet a performance requirement of that type of standard or NFPA 20 is similar. But the NEC is, is much more of a, a, a very black and white installation uh, requ requirement standard. Huh. That's very interesting. I appreciate that definition. Yeah, I was thinking about it recently and, you know, how there's, of course, there's requirements in IBC, IFC, and IMC for, uh, you know, electrical requirements. But yeah, I guess if it feels kind of strange to me is there's no like, there's no, is there an international electrical code as well? I guess I've just never had to look in that or is, does this, NFPA 70 really more of the the go-to when it comes to the installation or yeah how does that code structure work above uh, the National Electric Code okay all right um, well I think I think it's it'd be easiest because we're talking about uh, emergency power and standby standby systems that I delve into how all those all those codes interrelate right so um, I was I actually before our interview. I spent a lot of time trying to find a good resource for what a good process would be for determining what the emergency and standby requirements uh, for a property would be, and I didn't really find anything that that gave a step by step process. So, um, in to answer your question, but also to provide my to provide my process, what what I first do um, would be to look at the type of structure uh, from the International Building Code. So, and then building types such as high-rise buildings, underground buildings, buildings with atriums have specific emergency and standby power requirements or uh, require equipment that then requires emergency or standby power. Um, also, if the municipality adopts NFPA 101, the life safety code, then I'll also have to look at the requirements, of the article associated with that, with the property for that document, because they, they may be um, different and in, in addition to the IBC requirements. Um, then I would go over to chapter, chapter 27 of IBC, which is the emergency and standby power requirements of the International Building Code. And 
which states that emergency systems shall automatically provide secondary power within 10 seconds and provide for a two hour dur duration unless otherwise noted. And standby systems automatically provide power within 60 seconds and provide for a two hour duration unless otherwise noted. And the unless otherwise noted is really important because um, there, because that's not the the end. There's a lot more to figuring out what the emergency and standby power requirements are based on um, other codes and standards. So we next then have to look at the systems that we are providing for the property and see what the emergency and standby power requirements are because several of those systems have emergency and standby power requirements that exceed chapter 20, 27 of IBC. S you know, several areas of IBC and several areas of NFPA standards for each system, such as NFPA 20, NFPA 72, indicate the level, the type, and the class of the alternate source, and also if, indicate if the alternate source is to be treated as an emergency or standby power source. So where it states that um, in the NFPA standards and the IBC, is it's a direct reference to NFPA 110 and NFPA 111. NFPA 110 and 110 is emergency and standby requirements for, um, for basically generators. And NFPA 111 is the emergency and standby requirements for basically battery systems. So level describes the specific performance requirements of the system such as um, type of enunciation, type of reliability of the fuel source. For example, um, level one requires remote enunciation while level two does not, or, and level one systems, uh, if it's a generator, require uh, a reliable fuel source. Type describes how quickly the secondary power source will power the load. For instance, a type O, um, Type is a UPS system with absolutely no downtime. And then uh, a type M is manual. Class is the duration of the fuel um, or battery set, battery source. Class X means to that you have to look at the applicable code and standard. For instance, NFPA 20 um, is a class is fire pump to class X and they require eight hours. Now it's important to note though that that NFPA 20 NFPA 110 also requires an 133 percent safety factor to be taken when calculating these fuel supplies. So it takes into account fuel for testing, fuel sitting at the bottom of the tank that's not going to be used. So an eight so an eight hour fuel source is really 10 and a half hours when you're actually sizing that uh, fuel oil tank. Now, emergency, when it, where emergency and standby are stated in applicable codes and standards, this is a direct reference to NFPA 70 wiring requirements. Emergency systems are wired in accordance with NEC, 7, NEC Article 700 and standby systems in accordance with NEC 701, unless modified by the applicable standard such as uh, NFPA 20 has very specific wiring and installation requirements and NFPA 72 does as well. Um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there regarding what a level one and level two system is. I've, I've seen a lot of references um, in articles I've read that says that level one is Article 700 and level two is article is Article 701, and um, that's not fully correct. For instance, uh, fire service elevators require Type 60 Class 2 Level 1 standby power. Um, in addition, Level 2 systems do not require a reliable fuel source, where, whereas Article 701 specifically indicates 701, which is legally required standby systems, and if NFPA 70 specifically indicates that a reliable fuel source is required um, for a generator. Yeah, I think it's really interesting for me to hear you describe the process of navigating the IBC and how that relates to uh, reference codes and standards. Yeah, it's it's interesting. 
these are the kind of, you know, sort of formulaic approaches that uh, I find really interesting and, you know, why I'm surprised that, uh, you know, I, I think uh, it kind of blows me away that there wouldn't be an article out there stating what you just, you know, kind of laid down as a uh, basically a, a formula for how to approach the building code and how to evaluate emergency power systems um, as a component of the building code investigation. And yeah, I like what you're talking about, you know, how chapter 27 is specifically about emergency power, but also in the same way that you evaluate other buildings, there are special occupancy requirements in uh, chapter four. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. But yeah, I've never heard it described like that before. Yeah, it'd be nice if there was some sort of checklist. Maybe we could create one, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> we should. We should for sure. Yeah. <laughs> At the very least, I'm gonna be twisting your arm after this to you know break down that break down that again, or maybe I'll just transcribe it. But uh, yeah, sure. no, that was awesome. But uh, you know, we talked about uh, high rise a couple times, but um, yeah, there's also some interesting um, different emergency power requirements and complexities with. High rise, uh, yeah. Would you mind speaking a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. You know, high rise buildings operate different than non high rise buildings. Since the fire service cannot access the upper floors of a property by using um, the integral ladders in the fire trucks and the pumping a- apparatus of the, fi- of the fire engine may- might not have the capacity for really tall buildings to pump to the upper floors of the property, power must be present so that the fire service can navigate through elevators. And they could use the the fire pump for um, to flow through the standpipe. Um, in addition, additional emergency power is needed for the fire alarm system in a high rise building because uh, high rise buildings use partially va- partially evacuation voice communication systems, while as small smaller buildings um, have full evacuation. So. So for a fire alarm system where only a, a portion of the building is, is being evacuated, it's important that additional power is, is there to um, notify every, everyone in the building what's going on. Um, it's also imperative for a system such as stair pressurization to allow safe, safe egress out of you know, an extremely strong, tall structure that that may may lose power in the event of a catastrophe interesting yeah it's uh so high rise is a chapter in the ibc and for those who don't know i think it's you know it probably depends on what version of the ibc you have adopted but i think it's like chapter 403 and yeah, yeah 403 you're right that's right yeah and then once you get into chapter 403 of the building code you it immediately starts to escalate the amount of uh, fire protection and life safety measures that are required for the building. So, egress um, too, sure. right? Yeah, egress. Um, what, how, what fire protection systems are required? So then you have a voice system required as compared to uh, just a horn and strobe system. Right. The stairwell pressurization you mentioned before. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, some smoke control requirements. Uh, sometimes if you have atria or there's some kind of nebulous um, smoke evacuation requirements. But yeah, here, here, essentially- here, in New York, here in New York City, um, if you have a high rise, you also you also require what's what's called an auxiliary radio communication system, which is which is your equivalent of an, an emergency responder radio coverage system. So yeah, so that's like uh, an amplifier system for yeah. the emergency radio coverage and so yeah it's interesting because depending on where you're working you could be working in a jurisdiction like you just referenced that uh, directly requires that sort of system and then in other jurisdictions you may be able to uh, get a waiver or maybe they're not they don't they have good enough coverage from their um, emergency radio uh, antennas where they won't need a amplifier system for the building so yeah, that's something to be aware of for sure. It's a costly endeavor to retrofit one of those systems into a building. Most, most certainly. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, on the in the same vein of uh, vein of uh, 
you know, emergency power requirements. I, I loved hearing you talk about it in chapter 27, how the, the secondary power within 10 seconds requirement. I was recently just at a fire pump um, initiation test or a preliminary acceptance test for a fire pump. And we were having, uh, you know, some trouble. They had to modify the delay in the uh, transfer from the uh, fire pump controller to the to the generator in order to get that time under 10 seconds yeah they, but, they uh, had to, they had to they had to modify the um, settings on the automatic voltage regulator yeah so they, there's some parameter within the controller that they had to um, adjust in order to meet that requirement but I wasn't it's, it's actually it's it's three parameters. It's it's time, speed, and force and torque. So the the generator the generator is a motor, and the ultimate automatic voltage regulator. The technician is able to go in there and um, mess around with those three variables till to make sure that it it lines up with uh, with the the way that the fire pump controller is starting the fire pump. But it's also important that it's that that correspondence is set up in a way that um, the fire pump could also start in uh, emergency run starting mode. That's awesome. Yeah, I would just wanted to, you know, expand upon the uh, the requirements for fire pump and fire pump design. I know that um, whenever you have a, a fire pump, you're getting into NFPA 20, which kind of goes in line with what you're talking about earlier. You are getting into some different NFPA standards that have additional um, power and uh, emergency power implications. So, yeah, I don't know if you had any more uh, food for thought on that topic. Yeah, sure. Um, fire pumps are required per NFPA 20. Fire pumps are required to have level one, type 10, class X power. Um, when the utility source is either, either the utility source is not reliable, the building is either a high rise or an underground building as per IBC, um, or the pumping apparatus, the fire engine cannot reach occupied floors, which as per NFPA 20 is, is, uh, NFPA 20's appendix says that, um, that's typically 200 to 300 feet for most fire services. So, uh, most properties would require emergency power anyways, due to the high rise building requirement. Um, so in terms of the reliability of the utility, uh, NFPA 20 requires that if the power plant has been down for more than um, 10 continuous hours, which recently was changed. It used to be uh, more strenuous. It used to be four hours in the year prior to the uh, submittal of the plans to the building department or power outages have plagued that area of the protected faci facility or, or if the utility infrastructure is an overhead um, power line like a, a radial type distribution which would not allow the fire services fire trucks to perform their um, aerial operations from my, my understanding is that most fire services try to maintain a 10 foot distance from over overhead lines and in a in a worst case scenario uh, they would have the utility shut down the power um, to that radial network and they'd then physically cut the lines so they could access the upper floors of the building and get in there. Um, and in also in terms of reliability, NFPA 110 requires that level one power systems, which as I just said, uh, the generator for the fire pump has to be a level one power system, um, must be fed from a reliable uh, off must be fed from a reliable offsite fuel source or on-site fuels. And NFPA 110 states that unreliable sources are sources that don't tra traverse through an area of high seismic activity or an area prone to flooding or an area that's been deemed reliable by, by the serving utility. So when we design um, to determine if a, uh, if the power source and the fuel is reliable, um, we need to 
get that information from the serving utility. So uh, a couple years ago, I really ate some crow and I really put my foot in my mouth about seven, eight years ago. Um, I was working for a new university that had a campus of uh, several buildings, most with uh, natural gas generators. And I was walking through the campus with the head facilities engineer. And I noted to him that um, natural gas was not a permitted fuel source for emergency lighting and the fire pumps. And that I think most of his buildings didn't meet code. And uh, boy, was I incorrect. So the municipalities <laughs> I worked in before, uh, before dealing with this property uh, did not consider natural gas reliable fuel source. But both, the, both NEC and NFPA 110 allow natural gas when um, it's, it's improbable that interruption of both the gas and the electric utility will occur, occur simultaneously. So three days later, he sends me two letters, one from the utility saying that gas is reliable and has not been interrupted in over 10 years, and one from the local DOB uh, approving the letter from the uh, locally from the utility. That was a learning experience. Yeah, that's a good one. It's interesting you, you get in these uh, jurisdictions that have a high amount of specific amendments or requirements. You can get used to providing this... Uh, very specific level of coverage and system. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I'm working with somebody now who's done a lot of work in Clark County and Las Vegas. And, you know, when you get into these jurisdictions that have, you know, it's almost like you're you're doing work in a, in a different country. There's so much uh, <laughs> right, amendments. Right. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's easy to do what you're just saying when you, you get used to these uh, specific jurisdictional requirements. But uh, yeah, so uh, we talked about it a little bit, but yeah, I know this not on the script, but I thought I'd ask about, uh, yeah, what, what about, um, what's your take on uh, elevators and, uh, you know, um, what's required for elevators or shunt tripping of, of elevators and, yeah, the electrical design for that. It seems like the complexities associated with elevators is always uh, a point of, uh, contention or consternation on my part of um, trying to nail down the work associated with uh, providing the sprinkler coverage slash uh, all the uh, fire alarm devices necessary in order to um, accomplish uh, fully designing the electrical and fire protection systems for an elevator. Well, it depends on if you have a, a traction elevator or a hydraulic elevator, right? When you have a hydraulic elevator, um, the hy hydraulic fluid could be could be flammable. So in, in some cases, based on the the makeup of the hydraulic hydraulic fluid, you need sprinkler protection in that elevator shaft. And then um, when you have sprinkler protection in that elevator shaft, you need you need to uh, you need to be able to when the sprinkler he sprinkler heads activate to protect that elevator shaft. Um, you need to be able to shunt you need to be able to, t to turn off the elevator so you're not having water and electricity at the same time. Um, it's usually done through a heat detector at the top of the shaft. Yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great synopsis. It's uh, just always a pain trying to navigate the uh, elevator code and, you know, go through the uh, order of operations for, you know, is it hydraulic or is it electrical traction? You know, are the belts combustible? You know, uh, is, you know, if it's got hydraulic fluid, you know, is there a sprinkler in the, in the pit and in the up high, you know, and right. then, you know, what's in the, what devices are in the shaft? Is it smoke and heat or is it just smoke or heat? But yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's quite the gambit, but yeah, I appreciate your, uh, synopsis on it because it's just, uh, it's always something that I, I can never remember. Some stuff is real easy to remember, like, you know, whether you require uh, duct detectors or not for, you know, uh, IMC buildings. But uh, other stuff, it just seems like every time you got to go back and look at the notes and look at the code. Well, the other other, other big requirement is is the allowance that um, when you have when you have an elevator bank in these large buildings. New York City has a different, has more stringent requirement, but IBC, if you have a large building with uh, six elevators and one bank controlled by a common operating system, that uh, you would 
you'd size your gener- generator based on only one of those one of those elevators in that bank, and that um, in the case of power failure, all those uh, all those elevators would would return down to the ground floor or the sky, sky lobby level if if the ground floor wasn't the true ground floor, and um, then at the elevator control panel, you'd have the option of toggling back and forth between uh, which elevator would be the elevator to be provided with um, standby power. Interesting. I didn't know that. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit about, touch on a little bit of requirements for an integrated send- system seems to be a big topic in the industry right now. And um yeah, but are there any um, emergency power requirements for integrated systems or, you know, systems that are associated with uh, systems like the, the fire alarm system? Well, the, there's, very, there's very, very specific uh, emergency power requirements for fire alarm systems and for, uh, sy- and for systems that are interconnected with the, um, with the fire alarm system. Uh, NFPA 72 has a couple different options for um, emergency power. One of the options is using a UPS type energy storage system, which would be um, NFPA 111 type O class 24 level one, um, or using the same, the same, um, the same UPS, but with class four. So there's only uh, four hours of battery with a, uh, a level one class 24 generator. So the generator um, has 24 hours, has 24 hours of fuel. Um, the other option would be a, a storage battery with the ability to operate the system under a non-alarm condition for 24 hours. Then after that, uh, a period of either five minutes or 15 minutes in alarm mode depending on the system type, like uh, voice communication systems, as we said before, had um, need more power. They need to be on for 15 minutes after that alarm, uh, non-alarm condition. So after those 24 hours of not being an alarm, the system has to still be able to function for that that 15 minutes. And uh, here, here in New York City, um, we've amended that to be 45 minutes. Um, and then the other option is the same storage battery with the ability to operate the system under, uh, but un- under non-alarm conditions for only four hours, but to be backed up by a uh, type 10 class 24 um, level one generator. So the fuel re- requirements for the generator are also very specific to fire alarm systems. So in addition to this 24 hour requirement, the fuel supply also needs to include um, six months of testing reserve and uh, on-site. However, on-site fuel is not required if the, if natural gas is considered reliable and the seismic risk category of the property is not um, zone three or greater. So th- because of the difficulties meeting the above requirements for a system using a generator with an on-site fuel source, because you're getting into a very, very large, large tank to meet that 24-hour fuel requirement. What what would uh, what would happen is you'd either work with your uh, generator vendor and discuss control methods for load shed, or um, you'd ha- you'd use the the 24-hour battery. Awesome. Well, I wanted to get into some professional development topics before I let you go. But yeah, I just want to always love asking people um, what they view as a, a trend in the industry. You know, I I know we've talked about uh, a lot of different topics on uh, our emergency power, but yeah, I just wanted to hear a little bit about that from you. Well, you know, the biggest, I hate to state the obvious, but the biggest, uh, I guess the biggest trend in the industry right now in consulting engineering is probably working from home. You know, we, right now we have pro- program, we use programs such as BIN 360, VPN, Microsoft Teams. It's, it's so much easier to uh, work remotely than it ever has been before. And, um, you know, we're finding that um, our employees are just as efficient or in some case, even more efficient when working from home. 
Uh, one thing I'm really nervous about that I see happening in all this is that the rift between construction teams and design teams is growing deeper. So with all the construction meetings becoming remote, whereas, you know, we're calling in or we're, um, we're doing virtual, we're doing uh, virtual meetings for construction. Um, we have, we have less of a chance to interface with, uh, the contractors. And then it's because it's, it seems that one of my concerns is that it's going to become more of a us versus them scenario, especially on a project that, um, is your standard design, bid, build, construction agreement, you know, like that stuff like um, integrated project delivery or uh, or um, design assist is a little different, but uh, most, most of the projects that I work on are design, bid, build. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Uh, seems like, uh, and it, maybe it's just the projects that my companies work on. It seems like we're, uh, more and more projects that are design build in instead of the conventional design bid build but oh, right. yeah that, I, I like that commentary about uh, you know um, how communication and just like keeping the the team consolidated and you know of the same mindset of being we're on a team let's get this you know project delivered um, well like- is can be a, a challenge. Yeah, I I, per, I personally try to go out of my way to to get on site and and to meet with the contractors and and uh, to to meet with the construction manager if there is one, um, just to just to have some face time to show that you know I, I didn't just put out this set of documents and now you have to you have to build it that um, you know here's the here's the reason what that we we show what we show on paper and. Um, and also to hear uh, the contractor's input. Definitely, I think that's a good. I think that's a good deal. You know, I. It's easy to get into the mindset of us versus them, and you know, not being in a collaborative uh, a team role. For, you know, even in design build, I th- design bid build. I think it's important. So that's a good point. So so yeah. So another topic that. Uh, I find it interesting is just looking at fire protection and the construction industry and fire and life safety as a whole. And just, you know, thinking about where it's going to go in the future, you know, five, 10 years from now. Um, but yeah, I didn't know if you had any thoughts on that. I'm really hoping that they, they make the change to wireless fire alarm systems that they've made to wireless lighting control systems. So wireless lighting control systems have this 10 year battery, right? So, uh, and most of the wireless lighting control products on the market have it now. So that if, if you design, say, a lighting control system for an office building, then the, the batteries within those devices can wait 10 years or maybe eight years to be swapped out. Because at least from the products I've researched for uh, wireless fire alarm systems, the everything I've seen, all the swift wireless fire alarm systems have two year batteries. So it, it'd be, it'd be nice if that, if, if, th- ch- if that change gets made where they then have that 10 year battery and then you're not, you're not having that savings, that capital expenditure sta- savings, which then becomes uh, an operational expenditure every, every two years, which you know, quickly adds up. Interesting. I've never, never heard about that that's uh that's an interest interesting trend i would have never known about that um kyle i just want to end with uh one question um and just ask you know what resources would you recommend to professionals um in the industry or just in fire and life safety in general yeah where where would people go if they wanted to learn more about um emergency power requirements or uh just engineering or life safety in, in general. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I really like Paul Abernathy's podcast and his articles for uh, comprehensive reviews of specific 
um, code requirements. He delves into, he'll, he'll state the code section and then he'll give uh, a whole dialogue about that specific code section. I also think um, for electrical engineers, SOAR's grounding and bonding and the IEEE gray, uh, gray book are, are really must haves. I read them both um, cover to cover. Uh, I think one of the best, the, probably the best resource one could have is to grow yourself in a network of um, experts outside of your organization who have uh, the expertise, certain expertise that that you you personally don't have, you know. And it's it's really a give and take um, relationship that you have to build because uh, you don't want to just reach out to someone to ask them questions. You want to reach out to them to ask them questions and then have, the, have you have them ask you questions back. And by, by you providing insight to their problems, you, you're, you're building this rapport that, um, that you're there for them and they're there for you. Um, one of the, probably one of the best things that has happened to me um, in my career is, is uh, I befriended a, um, an electrical contractor who's um, been in the business for you know, over 40 years and uh, has a high standing in um, the code development process in New York City. And we, uh, we both talk fairly regularly um, about codes and standards and um, bouncing ideas off each other and even sometimes just trading more stories. And I think we've really grown our uh, expertise because of it. That's a great tip. Yeah, I appreciate the resources. And as always, I think that making connections within the industry is always important. And that collaborative uh, education and growth is it's, uh, it's unparalleled. It can't be beat. So... That's awesome. Well, Kyle, I want to thank you so much for your time and coming on the show and just say, yeah, thanks. Thanks for coming. And I really enjoyed it. Gus, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having, having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening, everybody. Be sure to share the episode with a friend if you enjoyed it. Don't forget that fire protection and life safety is serious business. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are by no means a professional consultation or a codes and standards interpretation. Be sure to contact a licensed professional if you are getting involved with fire protection and or life safety. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.